today to Recent Policing, uh, our, another edition, and uh, we are uh, glad to have the students here and, and uh, our guests here. So I will give it to Ms. Mary Texera, uh, Professor, Professor Mary Texera, and she can take it from there. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We, as always, as always, and we don't make any exceptions, we, we have a, an outstanding program for you today. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I would like to hand it over to Robbie Madrigal, who, who will be um, uh, doing our land acknowledgement. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I'd like to add my welcome and also uh, much appreciation to Dr. Futterman for joining us today. Um, we recognize that the campuses of Cal State San Bernardino sit on unceded and indigenous ancestral lands. We recognize that every member of the CSUSB community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, <clears throat> we are responsible for acknowledging and making the university's relationship with indigenous peoples visible. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indians and indigenous peoples. Pass it back to you, Mary. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and I, I, I think I'm not going to tell any jokes or anything right now because uh, nobody ever laughs at my jokes anyway. But I want, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Craig F uh, Futterman. He's a clinical professor of law at the University of Chicago, where he serves as director of the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project of the Mandel Legal Clinic. Before his appointment to the law faculty, Professor Futterman was a lecturer in law and director of public interest programs at Stanford Law School. So he's, you know, he knows California. He previously joined Futterman and Howard uh, CHTD, don't know what that means, a boutique law firm concentrating in complex federal litigation. There, he specialized in civil rights and constitutional matters with a special focus on racial discrimination, education, and police brutality. Before that, he served as a trial attorney in the juvenile division of the Cook County Public Defender's Office. He received his PhD, or sorry, he received his JD from Stanford Law School in 1991 and graduated with the highest distinction from Northwestern University with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Economics. Special thanks to the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the Fowl Library for sponsoring this program. And so without any delay, uh, I give you Professor Futterman. Thank you, Mary, Stan, Robbie, Jeremy. Um, let me just get into it. It's a late fall afternoon. Um, and I'm about to quit work for the day when, when my phone rings. And it's actually someone from within Chicago law enforcement who's calling to ask me for some help. They tell me about a police shooting. Two officers drive up on a 17-year-old boy who has a small knife in his hand. And within seconds of jumping from his car, one of the officers shoots the boy as he shies away toward a construction fence in an abandoned industrial area. The officer pauses the boy, falls to the ground. The officer then adjusts his aim and he empties his entire magazine into the boy's body as the boy lay lying in the street, writhing in pain. 16 shots. They tell me that it looks like an execution. Me, shot that boy like he was nothing but a dog in the street. End this video. So the word now that the shooting is already being covered up, just like so many others in my city. And they plead with me. They say, please, Craig, will you help, us, help me to do something to keep this from getting buried? We've got to put a stop to this mess. The boy's name was Juan McDonald. That call, um, that call led to a series of events that created conditions for the greatest hope for real and enduring change in Chicago, in my city, in my lifetime. Good afternoon. And it's wild. I say good afternoon. I like to actually see folks and I can't see everybody here because it's on the Zoom thing. Um, but I, I am deeply grateful. Um, Mary, Robbie, Stan, Jeremy, um, to invite for inviting me and making me a part of 
conversations here at Cal State San Bernardino that y'all have created on race and policing. And I kind of, it's, 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 it's a good time for me, or, or it's an interesting time for me, because I find myself in a pretty deeply reflective space lately. When I first came to Chicago from California as a new kid, I felt like an outsider, having no previous personal connection to the University of Chicago. And I always have considered myself young. Um, yeah, I see you smiling. <laughs> <laughs> But it's now been 23 years since I've left California. And the rea reality of, of, of this and waking up and seeing my bald head um, every day has caused me to, to pause and, and, and to reflect about all I've learned over my years in our clinic. I mean, when I, when I first came to Chicago, I actually had hair. I had braids. Um, it's been bald for quite a while. Um, and I guess so as a part of our conversations, I hope to share some of the lessons that my law students and I learned about race and policing over the last 23 years in the clinic. Lessons about how change happens, lessons that I hope that can guide each of you, particularly students, um, as you blaze your own trails. Um, let me share some background on my clinic and our work for maybe, maybe about a half hour and then would love to open things up to, to, to everybody. Um, so first my clinic, our clinic. When my hero Randolph Stone, and for those of you who don't know, many of you might not know that name, I'm not gonna give you the Randolph Stone lecture, but Lord, you need to know who he is, look him up. He's a critical part of our history, someone who's been a role model to me my entire life. So when Randolph and I founded um, what we call the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project back in 2000, so for a lot of you undergrads, before y'all were even born, um, it was the very first law school clinic in the country that focused on police accountability and racism. This is long before Ferguson and the activism we've experienced the last eight years or so. More than 20 years before, um, Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee on George Floyd's neck for those awful nine minutes and 29 seconds. Long before mainstream media began to give systemic police abuse of Black people any attention whatsoever. We strive um, to be a grassroots, ground up community based law clinic. And for the past 23 years, my students and I have been working alongside individuals and families in Chicago, people who've been most impacted by police abuse. We represent people abused by police in civil rights cases and criminal litigation, people who have no other access to justice. And at the same time, while we're standing shoulder to shoulder with folk, um, with our clients on the ground, we're trying to shoot for the stars at the same point. We're constantly asking one another the how and why questions, like how this individual instance of abuse relates to structural and systemic injustice. We work to improve law, policy, practice. In summary, we provide or we strive to provide real service to real folk in real need who otherwise lack access to counsel while fighting alongside our clients for systemic change. And most of all, I'd say that we aspire to be a, a community clinic. And our goal is that everything that we do, it isn't just informed by, but it's actually driven by community need. Cast down your bucket wherever you are. All right. I've never been, and I see another head now, but I've never been a big fan of Booker T. Washington, but his words here have um, always deeply resonated with me. And they've, they've guided our work in the clinic. Cast down your bucket where you are. Um, people often ask me when I talk or just even when I not talk, but people often ask me, what can they do? How can they address injustice? I believe it's, it is our responsibility to address injustice wherever we find it, but it starts in our own backyards. And so for us as a clinic that was a part of the University of Chicago Law School on Chicago's South Side, it began with casting our buckets down right there. And following the advice of another personal hero of mine, Brian Stevenson, it also began by getting proximate, the need to get close, to be proximate. And getting proximate, as my grandmother used to say, means coming with respect to, coming with humility. Soon after we launched this project, um, Police Accountability Project, Civil Rights Project in 2000, we formed, um, we formed a partnership with public housing residents. And, and actually this, the background that you see right now um, was what was then left of this community called Stateway Gardens, 
which made up about eight square blocks of Chicago South Side, situated just about 10 minutes from where I teach at the law school. And the State Street Corridor, where, where, where Stateway sat, was home to the largest concentration of public housing and poverty, indeed, in the entire nation, made up about a four-mile stretch of 10 and 17-story high-rise apartment towers filled with thousands of our nation's poorest families just struggling to make it. And you could see the stretch of the towers from the interstate highway um, in Chicago that divided public housing from the white ethnic communities on the other side of the highway, part of our racial divide. Everybody who lived at Stateway was black. Um, so residents there trashed out um, a vacant ground floor apartment four bedroom apartment that had been a haven for illegal drug activity and converted it actually into productive working space for us and some of the other folks we were working with. So we became de facto squatters off the lease, so to speak. Um, and from that post on the ground, we partnered with Stateway Gardens residents to build a robust human rights documentation and, and advocacy project that we call the Stateway Civil Rights Project. And this and, and that background that you've seen, it became a second home to my students and me for about the next seven or eight years. Um, one of the sad things, and, and, and I don't, and, and that have to acknowledge is that the entire community has since been disappeared by an Orwellian state project called the Plan for Transformation, which is a government policy of demolishing public housing communities to reclaim that land for gentrification or development. Among the folks um, who we came to know at Stateway was Diane. Um, she was then a 50 year old public school janitor, a single mom, always seemed to have a kind word. And um, one of the things that for folks who know me, I like to eat. Um, Diane always had, she was generous and had delicious food for her neighbors. Um, and then we just stopped seeing her. That friendly face, the smell of that home cooked meal is nowhere to be found. It, it, it turns out that over the course of about a year, um, five Chicago police tactical officers subjected Diane to a series of repeated assaults on her person, her home, her family, her religion. The group of officers, um, this group, widely known as the Skullcap Crew, forced Diane on two occasions to disrobe, bearing the most private parts of her body. They threatened her with a loaded gun, needle nose knot pliers, a screwdriver, leaving her convinced that they would rape or kill her. They beat and they choked her. They assaulted her with racist and sexist epithets of the worst kind. They tore up her home. They desecrated religious objects, tore down the cross on her wall, broke things that were just sacred to her. They threatened to plant drugs on her and falsely arrest her. They, they beat up her teenage son. And they even brought in um, one of her neighbors, a middle-aged black man. And then they forced her then 16, 17 year old son to beat the older black man for their amusement, like a stage cockfighting. We learned that these five officers had engaged in a years long pattern of abuse of black folks in public housing on the south side of Chicago. We heard multiple firsthand reports of their abuse, including their sadistic sexual abuse of Diane. And what distinguished them, what distinguished them above all was their overt racism and just the particular pleasure they seemed to take in the racist acts. Like they got their jollies off of abusing black people. And most of all, they knew that they could abuse Black folk in public housing with impunity, that nothing would ever happen to them. While um, we didn't initially conceive of our partnership at Stateway as a litigation project, we came to see the law as a powerful tool in a fight for police accountability. While nobody saw lawsuits to be the end all and be all, our, our neighbors at Stateway showed us creative ways that we could bring legal challenges that could upset some of the power disparities that facilitated that impunity and how legal strategies could, could, could support the community fight to challenge things like official secrecy and denial on the ground. So we brought a civil rights case, a federal civil rights case, federal court with Diane. We actually wound up bringing 
more than six major federal civil rights lawsuits with our stateway neighbors. First, I can't begin to describe the courage it took Diane to do this. I mean, it took months before she was even able to talk about what happened, what they did to her with us. And when she did, she could only do so in like bits and pieces, fits and starts. I mean, just imagine also the prospect, the trauma of subjecting herself to aggressive interrogation by the skullcap crew's lawyers attacking and accusing her while the denying while denying the reality of all that she experienced. Together, um, we sued the members of the Skullcap crew to hold them accountable for this statistic abuse of, of Diane. But we also sued the city of Chicago, City Hall, to um, expose the systemic conditions that allowed it to occur. Um, as a part of the lawsuit, um, this is kind of the wonky stuff, but we fought to get six years of city data about every complaint that involved police brutality and other serious abuse. And when we analyzed these data, we saw exactly why and how members of Skullcap crew believed that they could operate with impunity in Stateway Gardens. While the data didn't reveal anything that folks at Stateway didn't already know, the police department's own data made those realities difficult to deny. The police department could no longer deny the reality of Diane's experience by simply labeling her as a criminal and pitting her word against the word of a group of police officers. Because CPD's own data painted a portrait of impunity. We learned when we looked at this stuff, the police department refused to examine patterns of police abuse in black and brown communities. We learned that the probability that the members of the Skullcap crew would be disciplined when they were charged with abuse was virtually zero, non-existent that fellow officers would cover from every time that they were accused of beating on black folks, and that the department's practices, the very practices for investigating police abuse, were designed to ensure that officers like them would be immune from discipline when they hurt people. I used to call it a broken system, which was completely wrong because actually the practices in the system were very much designed to do exactly what we saw it do because we got to see them when we looked at these things, we observed how complaints of serious abuse were made to just disappear come in dirty, washed out clean. But um, the police department hid all this critically important, important information from the public, from the people, from all of us, and remained unexamined under city lock and key until now as a result of Diane's lawsuit. But the problem was it was given to us only under this strict protective order. We weren't allowed to share it outside of the litigation. So the systemic conditions that allowed the Skullcap crew to torture Diane still remain hidden from view. So um, we devised a strategy in state court to complement all that Diane was doing then in federal court. And we brought what's called a Freedom of, of Information Act lawsuit to take all the information that we pried from the police out from under that protective order and make it public, make it accessible to everybody. In this battle, you see, Y'all, it didn't just play out in the courts, it played out in the streets and it played out in the media and we were winning. Among the lessons my students and I learned is the importance of changing the narrative because we framed the public conversations in the media, not the police department, not the mayor, not the political administration. So instead of headlines about out of control crime, the need for desperate measures by the police, front page headlines instead read, what are they hiding? What are they hiding? And our victories on the ground in reframing this narrative paved the way for transformative victories also in courts. So after about two years of intense battle, we established the legal precedent in Illinois that police misconduct records belong to the people. Police misconduct records belong to the people. It's one thing to say or to win a legal precedent, and it's another thing to bring it home, to make it real. And our clients stressed, people say we stressed, when we said public, we mean public. So we work with um, community partners at a nonprofit that we helped to create called the Invisible Institute to build something that's called the Citizens Police Data Project. And what it is, again, wonky, but a public searchable database that gives everybody, and I mean everybody, ordinary people, researchers, journalists, policymakers, police officers, organizers, advocates, people languishing in prison, everybody with access about every single police misconduct complaint in Chicago. 
And I know there've been similar fights in California about the laws and opening up these records um, in California as well with, to, with ferocious fights against it. And, but what we did here first in Chicago, never had been anything like this in our history as a nation. Because this was a, this is, not was, it's a fundamental redistribution of power from police to ordinary people. And people are using this information every day in fights for justice and freedom. Perhaps though, um, the cruelest irony is that the city succeeded in that $1.6 billion Orwellian plan to demolish Stateway Gardens and its neighboring public housing communities before before we actually won the legal fight that created an official record that documented the reality of the conditions there, conditions of widespread abuse that stateway families were forced to endure. The city destroyed the scene of the crime, thousands of families' homes demolished. While um, the buildings have been raised, the questions raised by our friends at Stateway families' community remain. What underlying conditions allowed a group of officers to know that they could abuse black people like Diane in public housing communities with impunity? Let me share one final story, um, beginning with um, the most important lesson that we've learned over these 23 years in the clinic before we open things up. Change is not self-executing. It requires that we get proximate. It requires that we listen, that we humble. It also requires that we stand up, that we speak out in the face of injustice, and that we're persistent. Let's go back to that confidential call that I, I shared at the beginning after Mary introduced me. That confidential call about Chicago police officer, his name is Jason Van Dykes, execution of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald. When I got that call, wasn't anybody in the streets raising their voice about Laquan McDonald. The police and the press had written off this boy's execution, 17-year-old kid's execution, as just another unfortunate killing of a young Black teenager who attacked a police officer with a knife and was shot once in self-defense. Nothing to see here. And y'all know that, maybe you don't know, but let me tell you, stories like these appeared several times a month in Chicago media. The basic element's the same. Black person shot by police. Police at the scene say the shooting is justified. Authorities then rely on three words, three words um, to deflect any further inquiry. It's under investigation. Internal investigations then operate as a critical part of this machinery of denial, reifying the official narrative. They proceed quietly outside of public view, often taking a couple of years or more, and they are designed, as I said, designed to lead to a common result. In the seven years leading up to Laquan's killing, Chicago police officers had killed more than 400 people. That's an average of more than one person a week. More than 75% of the people who were killed by the police in Chicago are black. Not a single one of those killings was ever found to be unjustified by the city. So my point is, it, it, it took real work to bring any attention to Laquan's murder. This thing, it doesn't just happen by itself. To make people pay attention, it required persistence. And we investigated every aspect of what the caller told me. We went to the scene, we found, talked to witnesses. We got the actual autopsy showing what? Not one shot, but 16 shots not a single shot in self-defense. And we charted where every one of those 16 shots entered this poor boy's body. And everything that the caller had told me checks out. Completely different reality than the narrative that the police shared with the public, the narrative that was shared across the press and that was just written off as just another same old same. So we spoke out to whoever would listen. We published articles, open letters to the mayor, calling for the release of the video, calling for the truth. And we sued him. For the next 13 months, though, the city stood behind, stood fast behind its official story um, that this was nothing but just another justified shooting by a police officer's self-defense. 
until we won that court order that forced the release of the video. And I mean, now I know people are almost numb to these videos coming out, but at this point, this was like one of the first times ever, and it really changed. I don't want to say it's the first time a video was ever, ever, ever released. Um, I remember as a young person and something that, and when I was living in California, um, a video that also began to change the conversation about police abuse when the video of the police beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles was, was released. But um, now there is a greater and greater expectation that this is, of course, what needs to happen when there is, when a police officer shoots somebody or kills somebody. Um, but at this point, this was novel. That was something that had never happened in Chicago. They never released a video like this. And when we force the release of the video, Chicago becomes the leading national story, actually leading international story. Protest in Gulf, Chicago's Magnificent Mile, that's the city's most posh shopping district, a part of Chicago's famed Gold Coast. And it's Black Friday, bit, day after Thanksgiving, busy shopping day of the year. Um, young black folks use of this video of a police officer, of that police officer firing those 16 shots into the body of a 17 year old boy as he lay bleeding in the street contributed to a national awakening an awakening to the reality of police abuse in black and brown communities and the code of silence that protects it. So we didn't just simply expose the horrific execution of a black child at the hands of a police officer, but we exposed the routine machinery through which the police department hid and justified systemic violence against black people. And the entire world took notice. We forced the city of Chicago and people around the nation to actually have to reckon with this reality, pushing people past denial. The local prosecutor then suddenly, they have no choice but to file criminal charges against Officer Jason Van Dyke. Charges were filed the very same day we forced the video to be public. There's another way of looking at that, though. The other way is that in, Chicago, in, in, in Illinois, they're called state's attorneys. Y'all call them district attorneys, DAs. But you're, the prosecutor, the local prosecutor, never charged Officer Jason Van Dyke for any of those 16 shots that they had captured on video until the day we forced that video to be public. We filed a successful petition also to appoint a special prosecutor independent from the local prosecutor to actually prosecute the Quan's murder and the cover-up. And this results in the murder conviction of Jason Van Dyke, the Chicago police officer who fired those 16 shots into the Quan's body. And this um, was the very first time that an on-duty Chicago police officer has ever, ever been held criminally accountable for killing a Black person, ever. And I told you this was happening once a week. Police chief is fired. Local prosecutors voted out of office to be replaced by a woman by the name of Kim Fox, who some of you may have heard of. She's the first Black woman ever to lead the prosecutor's office in Chicago, someone who has actually since overturned more than 130 wrongful convictions as a result of Chicago police abuse. Then Mayor Rahm Emanuel sees the writing on the wall, decides not to run for re-election, and the U.S. Department of Justice. The DOJ now has no choice but to finally respond to our years-long cries, come to Chicago. Um, of course, the story doesn't end. Throughout history, every step in the direction of racial justice in America has been followed by backlash. People don't give up their power, their privilege without a fight. And as we're experiencing throughout this country, it's definitely the case right now. Our struggle continues. I believe um, that we are at a point of crisis in this country. And um, each of us, each of us, we have to decide what we stand for, what we believe in, who we are as a people. I mean, who we are as a people will be judged by the decisions we make in this time, in this moment. That means we need to be brave. Each of us has to be brave. We can't afford to lay back in the cut. And when you think about it, just, just three years ago, just three years after people around the world, people of all races, genders, ages, social statuses, lifting their voices together in protest of police violence against Black people and demanding change, 
Now, though, we once again find ourselves mired in on the midst of an all too familiar backlash, the same old tired narratives, stirring the same old fears of violence, fears of those dangerous others, defining my friends and neighbors at places like Stateway as these others and criminals, and our reflexive reach for the very same tired policies that we know don't work and that data has proven don't work. Um, and at the same time, not just work, but has done such affirmative harm to entire communities. Even though we've long known that police abuse is a highly patterned phenomenon, that five to 10% of most urban police forces responsible for most of the abuse, cities throughout the country still have resisted looking at much less using data about misconduct complaints to investigate crews of police officers like the Skullcap crew engaged in patterns of abuse. It's not just not knowing, it's actively choosing not to know to disregard science, to disregard knowledge, truth. I mean, as easy as it is in Chicago and other cities around the United States to look at obvious patterns of abuse complaints and investigate them and then get rid of the officers who inflict so much harm, there's not a single law enforcement agency in the country right now ever that does so. So my good folks, Cal State San Bernardino, all folks who are committed to justice, just that we can't afford not to act on what we know. We can't afford to return to denial because what we do know and we can't unknow is this. If we fail to address patterns of police abuse, we make it inevitable that Black families, communities like Stateway Gardens throughout America will continue to be marginalized and hurt. Our brothers and sisters continue to be wrongfully convicted, beaten, choked, killed. That's on us. That is on us. I apologize. We need to be willing to say some things, to share some truths that make people around us, that may make people around us uncomfortable, like the truth about crews of police officers who Try do not disturb, but uh, it's, it's not work. Um, like sharing the truth about crews of police officers who've been allowed to abuse black people in communities like Stateway Gardens with impunity. The truth about the Quan McDonald's murder didn't come out by itself. We had to forcibly tear that curtain back to expose the police department's machine of denial that covered up Officer Jason Van Dyke's murder of Laquan McDonald. The U.S. Department of Justice, they didn't just come to Chicago simply because the police department engaged in a decades-long practice of systemically abusing Black people. The DOJ came only because we gave the DOJ no choice but to come. So if we want to achieve justice, we want to address, we want to end, let's be bold, let's end systemic racism in America. Each of us has to use our power, our privilege to cast our buckets where we are, stand up, speak out, make even our own friends and family uncomfortable sometimes. It's not always gonna make us popular and we gotta be persistent. If there's one thing that I've learned in my 23 years in the clinic, it's that things don't change by themselves. Things change only when we make them change. Glad to open things up to questions. Dan, you know I have several, right? Okay, you can go ahead, Mary. I got some too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just start. I, I guess I'll start more generally. And that is, I think Chicago is a, um, you know, kind of a laboratory for, you know, all of those groups that came together at the beginning of the 20th century. And then, you know, what happens when they come together? Um so it, it's always been a special place, you know, Jane Addams, you know, Hull House and, and all of that. I've been reading about Chicago and its police force for a number of years now. And I, I recall a, um, a notorious cop, and you probably know whose name I'm going to call is John Burge. And he, you know, this Vietnam, Vietnam veteran, and um, he actually had devices uh, where he was torturing people at the station itself. And with all of that evidence, all of those testimonials, Burge was let go uh, with a pension. 
Uh, and I'm wondering, do you, are, is there anyone as notorious as Burge or has, has the love been spread, so to speak? Uh, is, 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 is it not just one person? Because, you know, when there's one person, you can always say, well, that evil person, right? Um, or, or even the 10%. But I always worry about the officers who are not saying anything, the, the 90% who are good, but who are satisfied with being in, a, in a, an organization that uh, abuses people. So I, I, I guess I, I just didn't have a simple question, but I just want to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is you're exactly right that, um, you know, this police abuse in the United States, and it's not just Chicago, and is not the problem of a few bad actors. Um, it's a problem of um, it's a system. Um, it's the rotten and it's rotten barrel. And so, while it's exactly true, and I mean, you know, it is true for the most part, and. I, and look at data at big city police part departments around the nation and if you talk to police chiefs throughout the nation they will also um admit or confirm they say yeah about 10 percent of of the force are responsible for 80 90 percent of my problems and um and then you know when i shared that wonky data work and i'm going to start there although this is very human um but um you know when we got and were able to look at every single complaint um, in the Chicago Police Department, if I was going to say the good news is what you just said is that 80% of the police of the police force um, had less than three complaints over the bulk of their entire careers. But um, but 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 that doesn't also mean that those and, and you got to it that those 80% are either blameless um, um, or you know, I don't know if you say good, bad, or whatnot, but it's true that, and the data also tend to show that um, a relatively few percent are responsible for the lion's share of the most egregious, ugly stuff. But the 80% and also um, the 80% stand behind those 5%. Um, and the cities and departments themselves have in place systems that allow those 5% to continue to abuse. And it's not an equal opportunity phenomenon. So the greatest determinant, and again, I'm sorry to live in the data, but the greatest determinant of um, abuse is the social status of the victim, black, brown, poor. Um, and among police officers, it's not evenly distributed either. Like I said, if 80% aren't getting all these abuse complaints and 5% are getting crazy, crazy amounts of complaints. Um, at the time when I first got this data, my five and six year old kids could have been like, daddy, here's where the smoke is. And it's that obvious. But the issue is how much work departments and cities go not to know, not to act upon what everybody knows. And when um, you allow, and, and kids often use these words to me, so it's like um, they talk about the real police. And I will hear stories and good stories. They'll make us smile like a good police officer, um, smiles at kids, greets them, um, treats people with respect and dignity the way in which we will all demand and want. Um, and at the same time, Officer not so friendly is right across the street, shaking down their friends, shaking down their neighbors, shaking down a parent. And officer friendly isn't doing a doggone thing of that. So the real police, according to when I talk to kids, isn't officer friendly. And often that smile feels like a lie to the kids because the real police are the ones who they see who are protected. Um, and that smile just acts as a, a, as a cover. So, I mean, there is, and, and, and I also don't want to just, I also don't want to make out. So number one, it's like the thing that I said, and there has been a lack of political will at anywhere in the nation. We can talk about the why, but a lack of political will at anywhere in the nation 
to actually then take that knowledge, take what everybody knows. When I walked around Stateway, we could talk about who your John Burgess are. And no, I think it's it, it's incredibly wrong and it's problematic if we all try to like say, ooh, Jason Van Dyke, it's all about that. So then the answer would be that prosecution. And I'm glad about that historic prosecution of Jason Van Dyke. I'm glad about the historic prosecution of Derek Chauvin in, in, in Minneapolis. But let's not be fooled that that historic prosecution and that rare prosecution somehow, okay, everything's solved. We put away, we actually addressed this one police officer because that's not the nature of the problem. And what we're also ignoring, and so one, um, one again, just the most basic thing, getting rid of the worst of the worst, the most racist, the most abusive, there's been a lack of political will to do a lack of will to actually, ooh, we have um, this information is right before our, at our fingertips. And this is something that police departments ought to be good at. We know how to do investigations. Investigate though, investigate them. And if they come up dirty, like, like most of them have, um, you fire them, you get rid of them, you prosecute them. And yes, that will go a long way toward also deterring others and also changing a culture because accountability does matter. It also changes the way in which kids see things. When kids see that, oh, the department doesn't stand behind that. Um, and rather than, you know, so like the Minneapolis and Chicago, it was like, well, the first instincts, and let's also, because if you go back to Minneapolis, what happened in Minneapolis, um, you know, when, when it came down to Derek Chauvin's trial, the Minneapolis police chief and everyone else was saying, that's not us. But if you go back to actually take a look at what had happened, it was the Minneapolis Police Department. It is the Minneapolis Police Department. They also, right from the very beginning, sought to cover it up. And but for a 17-year-old girl who was outside who videotaped that, there would never have been prosecution of Derek Chauvin that we saw. Um, but the other thing is that um, this egregious abuse, the worst stuff, happens in the context of just everyday unequal and disparate treatment of two-tiered style of policing in different communities. So um, what I didn't share, if I, I could share lots of stories, but just kind of the basic thing, one of the first things that my students could help but notice, particularly most of my students coming from privileged backgrounds, majority, majority, majority white students, um, and, um, and then working working then alongside me and alongside black folks in Stateway Gardens was among the first things that they noticed was I'm teaching them and other law professors are teaching them about the constitution in the classroom, but that they saw that something that looked like a completely different constitution on the ground there. because and, and, and something that they didn't experience in their own neighborhoods, because then what they would see would just be, mm, and there's everyday thing, and I'm not talking about the most egregious stuff, like what happened with Diane, and I can tell you more stories of, of out-and-out torture that put the bird stuff to shame that we saw with our own eyes. Um, I saw torture with a chainsaw. Police officer taking a chainsaw to somebody's head. Um, a father while his daughter, a 10-year-old girl, autistic girl, he's worried about his girl outside alone. They are torturing this man with a chainsaw for their pleasure in front of his neighbors because nothing's going to happen in him. And they said exactly those words, um, called them, well, call them all kinds of things out his, out his name. But um, those everyday, the everyday stuff of just being, being outside, shoot, uh, as, as, that, as that little boy's family in Kansas City, even ringing the wrong doorbell, but just being outside. Um, means that you are going to be treated with suspicion of being a criminal. And so while I taught kids in my law school class that, well, if you're going to stop and search someone, you need what's called a reasonable, articulable suspicion that that person is armed and dangerous. Um, and what my law students saw was that every young Black man, woman, non-binary person as well, um, expected to be treated with the suspicion of being a criminal and the officers out there, and I'm not talking about the 5%, I'm talking about the 100% saw it as their jobs and expected, this is what we're supposed to do. I mean, indeed, I'll tell one more, one more story and, 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 and then a question, um, cause I could go on too long, I know. Um, one of my students rode um, as a part of our class, she rode in the back of, um, of a police car um, 
and um, it was part of a sociology, a sociology class. And um, two officers and their duties were just patrolling um, public housing communities like Stateway, all black communities. My student, white woman, relatively, I mean, definitely privileged, pr privileged woman, um, was just shocked by what she saw. And what she was shocked by was what she saw was just treated as the normal baseline. It's that, so the officer, the, the car would stop and particularly young black men outside, see teenagers outside, everyone up against the wall, um, hands against the wall, spread ingle to be stopped, searched, rifle through their clothes, through the things. And um, pattern repeat itself again and again and again. And what shocked her wasn't just kind of like, ooh, this happened once, but it, but that like, this is normal that every black person expected to be searched and treated like a criminal. And the police officers felt that this is their job. This is what they're supposed to do. And this was something that was unimaginable where she came from. It was contrary to everything that we taught her about what the constitution is. So when you're talking about the problem of police abuse and police accountability, it's more than also just even that ugly 5% and the racist and the most racist 5% and the folks who cover for them. And when you even think about the amount of courage it took for that person to call me about the killing of Laquan McDonald, they still can't be known to this day. And the reason why they can't be known to this day is because um, you don't rat on fellow police because if you do, that's your life, that's your family, that's your job, that's your house, um, it's your safety. And so um, that's the kind of problem that we're really talking about when we're talking about systemic abuse, racism, um, and as opposed to a story of, ooh, there's one big bad torturer who served in Vietnam. Yeah, he is beyond um, a problem in a pale, um, but one, he doesn't stand alone, and two, most importantly, he could do and effectual and do what he did unless there was an entire system that allowed him to do that, and sometimes even encouraged him to do that. There had to be some John Burgess sending the message um, to again do what others would not do um, to enforce again a hierarchy um, and ascending a message of where everyone places is in society. And so a big part of the strategy before Stateway was destroyed was to keep everything in the box. As long as we keep black folks here in this community, um, in this ghetto, and we contain violence here. Nothing gets out the box, it's all good. Um, and what goes on in the box and what police do in the box, including whether they steal, whether they beat on people, it can be justified from the outside by media messages of violence, fear, um, and shoot, my own students were definitely afraid at first, like going to the projects, and I say, yeah. And I mean, among the first things, and it's ridiculous that my students had to learn this, was that families, children, people, teens, old, young, um, made up a community just like the very communities they came from, just as real of a human community, having the same issues, same problems, the same love, the same system to support, and actually had to deal with things, though, at the same point that were unimaginable to most of my students. Um, but that, yeah. I mean, the way in which that land clearance policy was even done, and I can just keep going, so I should stop, was, um, but, but I'll just share one other bit, is there was this, um, there was this, um, I remember this like a uh, billboard, and the billboard, um, it was a beautiful billboard, and it was called um, like Park Street or something like that, Park Community. It was, this was the new Nirvana community that was imagined to then take the place of Stateway Gardens. And so it's like all these beautiful images of like racially ambiguous folks, a grandfather skipping with his granddaughter, a little boy blowing a dandelion, words of like hope, community, diversity, all kinds of loving, great things. And then in big, bold letters um, as the title, a community coming soon, right? As though um, irrespective of how we think about the malevolence that I didn't want to impute upon this beautiful nirvana vision of community, um, but that our city's architects either have forgotten, they didn't know, or they didn't care that about the thousands of families who had called and made state their home.
that a real community existed here, exists here. Thank you for, the, for that. I'm gonna steal one of your lines, come in dirty, washed out clean. I like that. <laughs> That's a good line. Uh, my question is accountability. If all department complaints went to the DA's office, do you think there would be a change? Um, no. Um, first off, I mean, most DA's office, most district attorney's office have, and by their very nature, a symbiotic relationship, particularly with mm -hmm. the largest police departments in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, so most DA's um, around the nation are elected. And um, while more recently, there have been a number of DA's um, around the nation elected who hold more progressive values, um, that still the, the primary way by which a district attorney gets and holds and maintains their power, um, and also whether or not they're supported by very powerful police unions makes a huge difference in terms of whether they can get elected or can stay in office, um, is um, it, it, it's based on, um, are they convicting people? Are they locking people up? Um, and, um, so DA's offices are then dependent upon the police departments, that's the hand that feeds them, for their cases. And so, um, and this is why, you know, I mentioned in the story about, um, okay, well, the, the state's attorneys in that case, they had video, they had video of a police officer, a white police officer, literally emptying his magazine, into the body of a kid who's laying on the ground. Prosecutor had that information. They didn't do anything with that information until people forced them to do it. And then we petitioned, as I said, for a special prosecutor independent who didn't have that symbiotic relationship to be appointed. So um, no, just simply giving complaints to a local prosecutor um, I, I don't see as, as being the answer. Um, and to me, it's also, it's not just about criminal prosecution. I mean, so it, it, it's, um, let's just start with, uh, I mean, so I think the criminal prosecutions, um, I don't have a problem with there being for all criminal prosecutions, there being a high standard that it's not just you make a mistake, you criminally prosecute. But if you do something malicious, when you do something like what I just described, um, damn well should be criminally prosecuted. But but apart from that, though, it's like, you know, th this is, we entrust police officers with um, extraordinary powers, powers that we give to nobody else, the power to take people, to take our liberty, take our freedom, the power to um, use force, to use violence against people, to even kill people in the name of protection, in the name of public safety. And, um, if officers, and there's a culture, um, and still an all too dominant culture, which is contrary to at least what the ideal version of policing or public safety is supposed to be about, but there's a culture among the police departments throughout America, for the most part, it's kind of us against them. Nobody gets us but us. And anybody who's not police is a potential threat. And particularly if you're black or brown. And, um, so if a police officer doesn't understand that with those incredible powers comes an accountability, and that's your question, comes an accountability and comes with the territory, I don't just expect, but I embrace people from the community. They get to see what I'm doing because I'm given the power to kill. I'm given the power to take people's freedom in the name and I work for you. The community is the senior partner or ought to be the senior partner in any community police relationship. And so if any officer, and this is the issue of accountability, doesn't see and doesn't get that because there's a lot of angst right now around the nation of 
whoa, now that there's scrutiny and people are giving police scrutiny, people don't want to be police officers. Police officers are leaving. And this is going to be controversial, what I say, but it shouldn't be controversial. Good riddance. Good riddance. How do you change a culture? You get rid of, it begins, I mean, there's two things. You got to uplift the good and you got to do a lot to create the good. But it also means you got to get rid of your cancers. And if you're not down with the most basic premise that with these powers comes an accountability to the people who I'm sworn to serve, you got no business with a badge or a gun. Thank you. We, we, we do have a question here. It says, um, could reform or removing uh, qualified immunity allow for more accountability? And as much as uh, my char charging, could decreasing the power of the police unions also allow for more accountability towards officers who abuse their authority? Uh, I find it uh, out outputting to see the officers suspended or leave with pay and generally they are uh, acquitted for, or found not guilty. Police seem to have extra legal protection to do their jobs. That's kind of down the same line I was asking. Yeah, excellent question, by the way. One of my students, uh, Craig, but All right. I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, I mean, so qualified immunity, I mean, I definitely support the elimination of qualified immunity, but I also don't want to um, paint an untrue picture about what that will accomplish. The primary reason why I support that, it's not just about accountability, it's about um, also, so this is civil liability. And so here, let me take a step back because not everybody might know what qualified immunity is. So let me, let me say, so there's a doctrine that was created by judges. It's nowhere in, you know, mandated by any legislation, but judges created a doctrine many years ago that protects police officers and other public officials when they've actually violated people's rights. They violated the most fundamental rights, the Constitution of the United States. And um, instead of, um, as the law that created um, the right to bring civil rights suits um, meant to do, and, and, and it gave people the power directly to bring a civil rights lawsuit against a police officer who abused their power and authority to violate your most fundamental rights um, and created a new barrier and said, even if the officer violated your most fundamental rights, um, we're gonna create a new doctrine of call it qualified immunity and we'll impose a standard where even if you violated, even if it's, there's no doubt you violated um, someone's constitutional rights, we'll create ways that basically you can get out from under. And I'm not gonna get into all the technical details of it, but it's, it, it's a doctrine that really applies to prevent both the litigation, lawsuits and liability of officers who actually have violated people's civil rights. Um, so um, of course I support eliminating that. that, that that's, that's an easy one, but I, I, but I mean, the primary reason I support it um, isn't just a, an accountability reason, but it's about also what I equally think is critically important is what about the survivors and victims of police abuse? And what that doctrine of qualified immunity does is deny people who have undeniably been had their most fundamental rights violated by a police officer any access to justice, reparations of any kind, no matter how badly they were hurt. So, yes. But what I also don't want to create the illusion that if you eliminate qualified immunity, it's all good, then um, there will be an accountable police department. That's also just simply not true. Um, and um, it would eliminate one and one of the many, many procedural barriers that stands between police officer liability and, um, and, and, and you know, the antithesis of impunity, but one of the realities also is even when police officers are found liable in like 99% of the cases, um, they're not paying a dime. Um, they'll be picked up by the taxpayers. 
And I'm also, that's actually, I'm, I'm not fully criticizing that because back to point number one, it's, um, I want to ensure that people who are survivors and families who've had their loved ones victims, fall victim, prey to police abuse, have access to reparations and have access to justice. And indeed, the department that employs that officer ought to be on the hook and it ought to create incentives because if you're on the hook with the pocketbook, um, that you should be holding that officer accountable. And um, you shouldn't be able to stay in office if you're wasting in Chicago now, um, I'll put dollar signs on it, um, um, like nearly a half billion dollars um, or a billion dollars, I believe, in the last 10 years in terms of payouts. So um, yeah, so that's that's qualified immunity and in respect to police, with, with respect to police unions, um, I believe in due process and I believe in due process for everybody. So I also believe that police officers should have, just as every other person in the United States ought to have fair procedures and have a right to defend themselves. There's no doubt about that. I'm not like take out the firing squad because a police officer is accused. Police officers can be wrongly accused too. And I know viscerally what it means and what it feels like to be wrongfully accused of something that you did not do. But police unions, um, police unions, and again, the largest police unions throughout the United States have not done, not only they've done a disservice to the people and the public, all of us, um, in again, creating systems of impunity and protecting the worst among them, but they've also done a disservice to fellow police officers. So, and again, I'm in Chicago, so I'm gonna use Chicago as an example, but um, in Chicago, it's been, shoot, I mean, in terms of who leads, and here's the Fraternal Order of Police is the biggest police union here. Um, and, and it's part of a broader national police union. Um, who leads the Fraternal Order of Police and who's always led it? White men. Um, black folks aren't allowed and it's made clear. Women aren't allowed. Um, and those folks who not only have led it, but those folks who have run it um, by, um, by, by basically being the voice and the voice of denial, the voice of resistance to change, to needed change, the voice of, when I say denial, denying torture, denying racism, denying wrongful convictions, denying reality, and just, that is not serving the vast majority of police officers and the people, and there are lots of people I know who became police officers for the very same reason. I wanted to go to law school and become a lawyer to actually be of service, um, not doing anything well, well or right. I'm reluctant to just like speak up just generally about because I believe in the power of the people to organize. I believe in the importance of unions and in public employee unions as well. But I will say, and, I, and it's not just about too much power, but that um, there's been something about police unions, particularly in the United States that have had a long, long legacy of racism, a long legacy of exclusion, and um, a legacy actually of reactionary politics that have supported the worst among us. Go Mary, go ahead. Thank you, Stan. Um, I think we're gonna have to start wrapping up now, uh, Craig, but I, I, there's a couple of things. I, 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 don't, I think you know, you've had a long enough career where you can sort of see the trajectory of, you know, it, it not being, you can't talk about police abuse in polite company 20 or 30 years ago versus today. And we, we hope that we are contributing to that. Uh, we're talking about it now. I mean, I, I speak with people in various parts of life who, who are talking about uh, police abuse, uh, the police abuse of power, uh, qualified immunity, get them where it hurts in the pocketbook and all of that. You know, uh, the, the profession of policing is, is actually uh, not looking really good these days. And I think that's a good thing. I really think that's a good thing. And I, I think I, I don't speak for the rest of the, my, my fellow panelists, but there's nothing more that brings me to tears than kindness. And, and that's what I'm taking out of your talk today. Uh, I heard you use terms of endearment for victims, you know, this poor guy. 
And we haven't heard that a lot. You know, we've talked to a lot of academics, um, uh, attorneys and victims and so forth. We haven't heard that that kind of empathy that has uh, come from you today. And I just want to thank you for that. And I want to congratulate you for that because you've wound, you, you, you've managed to do good work, but also to understand humanity, people's humanity. So I just, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I only speak for myself, but I know the other people on this panel and I don't think they're going to throw me off the panel because I said that, but uh, I, I appreciate that so much. And I think our students do too. I think you've, you've taught them something about, uh, about um, feeling and, and about empathy and about caring for people who don't necessarily look like you, but you know, it's like you said, we all hurt. We, we are all hurting because of what we are allowing our public uh, employees to do. You know, we are not hitting them in the pocketbook. We are not uh, holding our city council people. We're not holding their feet to the fire on this. Um, you know, we had a district attorney in Los Angeles by the name of Jackie Lacey, who, you know, you know, who, you know, a, a police officer could do no wrong in her in her view. And she's a black woman. Uh, you know, not, not that we always expect that from black women, but this was especially you know, uh, just horrible, just horrible. And so uh, we've got someone better now, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think you keep working because of your, you have hope, obviously. Um, and we do this because we have hope. We, we at first did it because we were angry and we were just so hurt over what we saw in that nine and a half minute video. But now we're doing it because, you know, we want to, effect change, um, not only in our community in San Bernardino, but but uh, nationwide also. So again, thank you. I, I said that I, I went on a little too long, but but thank you so much, Craig. Appreciate that. And also, Craig, I, you, you said something, we are in a crisis. And we are. And, and you said we can't ignore in, uh, injustice. And I think that's for the students. I think that's something they need to to hear. And when they see it, they need to react. And and like you have, I mean, I, I, I'm a, it's amazing that you're in a city that that was so bold as to tear down uh, state way as to, <laughs> to, get, to kind of get rid of the. That's a big move on their part, and they did it. It's, it's, it was that important to them to to be clean, you know. It's amazing. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, hopefully, we can have you back again sometime. Thank you both so kindly and um, know that I'm touched. I'm so deeply humbled and um, I am so grateful for what you're doing. Things don't change also without conversations like these. It begins with knowing, but we got to do more than know. We got to actually act on what we know. There you go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thanks. You take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, students, for joining us.